Hey there, Cats and Giddies. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, coming at you live to talk about the Season 4 episode of Black Mirror, USS Callister. Now, I want to preface this video by saying, number one, there is going to be spoilers in this discussion review. Um, you know, so if you haven't seen the episode, you're going to want to check that out before listening to what I'm going to be talking about at length in this video. Uh, come back after you've seen it. But also, I want to put it out there that I have yet to watch any other episode of the series Black Mirror. Um, back when the earliest preliminary imagery, the teaser imagery for this episode came out, my interest was thoroughly spiked. It was peaked, and I made a vow to myself, a promise that, you know, even barring watching any other episode of the series, if I do not at least watch this episode... You know, being somebody who is a Star Trek fan and a fan of sci-fi comic books, you know, stuff, uh, very geeky stuff, Doctor Who, Star Wars, you know, DC Comics movies, Marvel Comics movies, all this kind of stuff, you know, Star Trek, as I say, um, if if I didn't watch any other episode, I needed to watch this one, being, being a fan of that stuff, and I needed to see exactly what they were going to be doing. Um, and, you know, there, there has been a lot of speculation, well, are they going to be paying homage to Star Trek? Are they satirizing it? You know, is it a spoof? How exactly are they approaching this material? You know, how does Star Trek, as an extension, you know, play into it and that kind of thing? And I love that from the get-go, they kind of subvert expectations. It's not satirizing or spoofing Star Trek. It, it does pay it homage to a point um, and I use that term subverting expectations because it's all over the place as of late with another big time sci-fi property that you may or may not have heard of that <laughs> had recently had its latest installment uh, released, may having something to do with this guy. Um, and that's what they've said about that particular feature film, that it subverts expectations. And, and But, you know, that's exactly what this episode does, even without having really any expectations going into it. It immediately introduces you to the character of uh, Robert Daly, I, b I believe is the character's name, as portrayed by Jesse Plemons. I hope I'm, you know, pronouncing that correctly. Um, who, for some reason, kind of reminds me of Mickey Dolenz. He, he facially <laughs> looks similar to Mickey Dolenz from The Monkees. And uh, I think I liked his, his portrayal and his characterization that much more for that, because there's almost this you know, unchecked uh, innocence that, that is brought forth, and then this comedic aspect, like... Your guard is down because of of the way, you know, Jesse Plemons happens to look. At least uh, that that was how, you know, I reacted to him being completely unfamiliar with any of his work prior to this. Um, I just immediately I, I found myself endeared to him and, and seeing things from his point of view, being sort of the outcast in this, you know, production company that has created this MMO game, uh, you know, called Infinity, I believe it was, and it's his creation. He is the coder, he is the creator, but he is kind of, you know, everyone's afterthought within his own company. He should be <laughs> the head of the company, um, but he's got somebody who is actually serving sort of as his boss. It's supposed to be more his partner, um, but, you know, like, he, he's kind of creepy, he's kind of a shut-in, a loner, and everything like that. He, he's not very, he's kind of socially inept. He's not very uh, sociable with other people. And, you know, you kind of, you feel for him. Again, there's a disarming quality with just the appearance and, and the way the actor Jesse Plemons uh, characterizes his performance from the get-go. And it subverts the expectations because what you find as the episode unfolds is that, man, this sucker is sick and twisted and misogynistic and spiteful and hateful and and you know has a bloodlust and and just it's it's insanity and the thing of it is it's ironic because while it does pay homage to star trek as a backdrop you know he is somebody who who grew up appreciating reruns of the in black mirror uh you know episode equivalent uh, series from the 60s called space fleet that had comic books and it was a series on tv you know um it does pay homage to Star Trek along those lines, but I found it somewhat ironical because the story itself highly, highly reminded me of the kinds of brain-teasing sci-fi, you know, uh, uh, stories that I would see in, in episodes of, like, The Outer Limits or The Twilight Zone or even from growing up when I was in my teens going to middle school, Star Trek The Next Generation. There was an episode of Star Trek TNG 
in particular, which involved, uh, because I am a Sherlockian, and I've read all of the, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle original Sherlock stories, you know, two or three times, um, and really, really love them. Uh, but there was an episode of The Next Generation where Lieutenant Commander Data, the android on board the Enterprise-D, and the engineer, the chief engineer, Jory LaForge, um, had gone into the holodeck in the guises of, you know, Sherlock and Dr. Watson. And they sought to create some sort of, you know, uh, uh, penultimate mystery that Data being an android who had the super fast calculations in his, you know, uh, electronic brain, positronic brain and all that kind of stuff, you know, he, he wouldn't so easily crack the code, so to speak. He wouldn't so easily figure out the mystery. It would give him something that would be actually challenging for a change. And in doing so, the way they calibrated the coding, if you will, is it, it answered to that by creating an actually sentient holographic personality in the form of the arch nemesis of Sherlock Holmes, Professor Moriarty. And uh, suddenly the ship was being endangered by this personality come to life. He could, you know, command and control computer algorithms and everything like that and, and, and made very much the crew of the Starship Enterprise subservient to him and, and uh, endangered them and everything like that. And so it's dealing with all of these moralistic and, and technological values and questions and quandaries, um, as well as really sort of putting under the microscope what is AI, what what is the soul, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's very much, this episode is cut from similar cloth in that we're dealing with, you know, people who exist outside of this MMO in the real world for all intents and purposes, and I guess it's the not-too-distant future because they have sort of plugins that that you know plug their jack their minds into the virtual environment it kind of reminded me as an anime fan and i mostly cover anime on this channel um but it reminded me of the series sword art online which was dealing with an mmorpg where in in that series you would don a helmet and it would you know siphon your brain into the virtual digital world which would be very much lifelike but it was fantasy rpg based Whereas in this, it's kind of a Mass Effect thing where it's a very futuristic sci-fi game and they have these little, like, kernel things that, you know, go apply to your temple and you jack in that way and you interface and interact with this virtual environment. Um, and the character that we're first introduced to, as I say, uh, Robert Daly, I believe, is the character's name, as portrayed by Jesse Plemons, you know, he is the creator of this um, and he's created the entirety of the code and everything like that, And uh, but he is the afterthought in his company. So where he, where he can't vocalize his frustrations in the real world and everything like that, he has created his own little bubble makeup of this game, this MMO game Infinity, that he created and spearheaded. And into it, using this technology that was kind of... A little bit questionable to me um, because it very much applied, you know, utilizing the DNA of, of people rather than you would think sort of like memories or, or the mind, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, although I guess arguably there is a, an ingrained sense of, you know, cognizance and being and, and what makes up a person looking at their DNA. Um, I just thought it would, it might have been more interesting if, you know, people had jacked into this game and he would usurp their mentalities, kind of, sort of, a la Total, Total Recall or something like that. Um, minor gripe <laughs> in the overall, you know, abundance of the creativity of the story. Um, but he would take out his frustrations and his anger and his rage and everything like that on these submissive doppelgangers of people he was frustrated with in the real world in his office environment where he is an afterthought where he is all but forgotten where he isn't appreciated for his genius and all this kind of stuff and that's where we have this very sick twisted you know equation of of his personality coming to the fore um and again it it, it sort of questions all of those moral quandaries uh you know about these well these are AI equivalents, they're doppelgangers, they're not the real people, but they do seem to be sent, sentient, they, they do seem to have an awareness of their surroundings and, and where they find themselves, they cannot be killed, but they can suffer endlessly and all this kind of stuff. Um, they, they could potentially exist forever in the digital ether that surrounds them. Um, always submissive at his hand, where, where, like I say, he jacks in and he's going to just you know, ream them six ways to Sunday. And, and if they don't play along, if they don't 
work with him and do what is expected of them, he just loses it, you know, that kind of thing, in a very sick, twisted fashion. Uh, to the extent that when it comes to his, in the real world, business partner, kind of the boss, you know, overshadowing him and everything like that in in the production and facilitation of this game that he has created, you know, in the digital format, in the game format, his own little cordoned off bubble, if you will, self-contained bubble version of it, which has been heavily modified and modeled, as I say, to match this Space Fleet 60s era comic and, and TV show, you know, he has a very subservient crackdown that, that he implants and, you know, applies, rather, on this boss character in that digital medium. And when he got f super fed up with him at one point, he, he had hijacked the DNA of his real-world son, a young boy who left a lollipop in the office. And he has, you know, he has that technological, as I say, sort of questionable device that can siphon out the D DNA and recreate a digital doppelganger of people as they appear out in the real world. And so to really drive home the point that you're going to do whatever I say or else... If, if, you know, like I could torture you pointedly for the rest of all time until we all actually die in the, the real world and everything. Um, but I want to I wanna hurt you even harder, Core. You know, I want to hurt you even deeper. And so he brings this doppelganger of the boss guy's son, the partner's son, into the game. And then he throws him out of an airlock. And the performance of uh, Jimmy Simpson, who, who plays this character... Who, by the way, is somebody I recognize from somewhere. Um, the actor, Jimmy Simpson, I, I don't know offhand from where, but I, I, I kept thinking all throughout the episode, I know him from somewhere, damn it. Um, <laughs> but in any case, the performances all throughout this episode, and his especially in that moment where he is describing the horrors, the horrific scene of, of watching his child, his son, be thrown out into space and and the body just being destroyed and frozen and crackling apart all of the suffering that his child would have gone through in that moment all of the suffering and anguish he was going through in that moment he he's very much reluctant to try to rebel because he has been so conditioned horrifically and again the the performance his performance in that moment just blew me away um and as i say the performances all around in this episode are stellar no pun intended everyone involved in this episode from jesse plemons as this this character who in the real world is very quiet and subdued and and keeps to himself somewhat of a shut-in but the creator of this grand magnificent mmo game and everything like that uh who is the overseer of it who is the afterthought to everyone else in the office from him to Jimmy Simpson's character, the, the partner boss, who is the one who is most pointedly suffering every time, you know, the Robert Daly character jacks into his little cordoned off version of the game. Uh, you have uh, Michaela Cole, who, you know, she is sort of like the Uhura equivalent and uh, her trying to implore. It all surrounds this character who is portrayed by uh, Kristen Milioti, who I have a thorough crush on. <laughs> just going to lay it out there. Um, I am thoroughly, thoroughly smitten with her. Uh, sounds Italian. Uh, you know, I'm Italian, Jersey born, everything like that. And uh, I mean, she, she kind of looks like she might be, and I like the Italian name. Um, but her character, Nanette, I believe is the name. She's a new comer to the office in, in the offline, non-in-game world, you know. And she is very much impressed with, and not really smitten with, the Robert Daly character, the creator of this game, but she she is enamored by his his technological prowess, the code that he created to create this game, and she's kind of like meeting one of her heroes, meaning meeting an idol. This is why she chose to work in this environment. Um, some of the other office workers end up sort of getting in between she and his character, and he doesn't like that. So he makes a point of going and stealing her DNA via a coffee cup, you know, that she had pressed her lips to, and creates a doppelganger of her in this environment. And we're kind of, you know, introduced to that world through her eyes, being a fish out of water, just suddenly waking up in, in this very 60s 
esque, you know, Star Trek like, space fleet like environment. And she's losing her crap. She's losing her ever loving crap. And you have, like I say, uh, the, the Michaela Cole character who who is trying to implore her and trying to make her understand what's going on. Try to try to you know backpedal her anxieties and her fears so she doesn't really <laughs> you know lose her crap. Um, she's warning her about the dangers and imploring her to try to chill out and and, and relax. Whereas you have the the boss partner character as portrayed by Jimmy Simpson. He's like, oh, we're all going to die here. This is the worst thing ever. It's hell on earth. I mean, it's hell for all eternity. We feel pain. We feel suffering. We can't we can't take pisses and, and shits, you know, uh, pardon the language, but <laughs> they have no genitalia, as he blatantly reveals um, at one point. And he's just he's just the chicken little of, of, you know, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. We're all doomed. And so it's not having a good effect on the Nanette character at all. And uh, what I really loved, you know, again, to, to say the performances all throughout, you even have like this character um, who is like the villain and it's somebody else that this, you know, Robert Daly knows somewhere along the way um, out in the real world. He, you know, he took like an office worker and, and made her a giant alien creature on a planet that has to be destroyed, you know, and this villain character uh, has to be very much the mustache twirling 60s equivalent of a villain like, ha, ha. I'll rule all, you know, I'll destroy you all and all this stuff. They're chasing him down every time he jacks into the game to get this crystal uh, of power or something like that, energy crystal, whatever it is, back from this villain. And even this villain, at one point, there is a confrontation between Daly and all of the crew of his ship, the USS Callister, which are made up of all the doppelgangers from people he knows in the real world who are being forcibly sustained in that role, you know, in that environment. Uh, they they act accordingly to his wishes or they suffer for it. You know, they all pointedly beam down to a planet and confront this villain and you think he's going to finally destroy the villain. He shoots him, the villain falls off a cliff and they they get in real close on the actor playing this villain, uh, which I, I was looking at the IMDB, I think it's uh, the actor Billy Magnuson who plays the, the villain Valak or something like that. Um... And he is, he is praying pointedly for death. He wants to be released from this, you know, sort of virtual digital hell, uh, you know. And he's kind of, it's no longer just, oh, you defeated me, Captain, good on you, and everything like that. It's kill me, you, you must end my life, and all this kind of stuff. And you think the Captain, the villain, really, the real villain is going to do it, but then he backpedals at the last second. He's like, no, that wouldn't be according to Space Fleet code. And so you feel so much sympathy toward this villainous character, this mock villain, because you know what essentially the captain is saying is, no, I'm not done with you yet. I'm still going to have fun with you. I'm still going to put you through hell. For all of the hell I feel like you put me through in the real world, and such like that. And so with the debut of the character of Nanette, uh, again, Kristen Milioti, who Wow, <laughs> she, she's a doll. Um, I digress. You know, with with the addition of her character, she is finally somebody who is like a voice of reason. She's she's the instigator of trying to break free of this and trying to figure out a way to get back at this twisted Robert Daly Captain character. You know, everything like that, both in the virtual digital environment, but in the real world as well. She wants to save all of their lives. And it just so happens to coincide with a patch that is soon to be applied. It's supposed to be applied by the end of the same day when we start the episode. But because, uh, you know, the Robert Daly character is distracted by all of the interpersonal conflicts going on in the office with the debut of the new girl who seems to really hold him in high esteem, but then she has her attentions being driven away from him by the boss and by the secretaries and by the temps and everything like that. He's he's spurned, and so, you know, he, he wants vengeance. He wants to take out his frustrations on all of them. You know, um, so his mind is not on the patch that needs to be applied when it needs to be applied, and it ends up getting pushed back to, like, Christmas Eve or something like that. 
and all hell breaks loose from the boss that makes him go back into the virtual environment that is very much the space fleet Star Trek aesthetic and he punishes him that much more and whatever like that and uh, so because this this patch is up and coming the digital doppelgangers just need to sort of you know bide their time long enough for this patch to take effect and once it does it manifests as a sort of space fleet era offshoot wormhole you know um which if they can figure out a way to pilot the uss callister in into the wormhole this patch it should excise them all from the system thus thus ending but saving their their digital doppelganger lives their their sentience and, and all that stuff free them from this prison that they are they are unable to escape from under the command of this robert daly uh, you know, and it's it's so fascinating how it works out because, uh, and and I don't know if I actually want to spoil the ending, um, but it it almost becomes like a Mission Impossible thing where Nanette in in the digital environment has to get in contact with her real world equivalent, and she's got some like naughty photos saved in her iCloud or whatever like that, and she has to blackmail her real world version, the real world version of herself to take steps out in the real world to go to this Robert Daly's apartment and, and call and, and have a pizza ordered that can, you know, uh, take his attentions away from the game long enough for her to go in and steal all the artifacts that have the DNA of, of all of these respective people who have been put into the game as digital doppelgangers. And, and she has to, you know, sneak in, grab that stuff, switch out the, the jack-in little appliance so that he can't get back into the game right away so they can, they can stall him effectively enough to steal his technology in the game so they can they can command the ship and whether or not they are successful i will leave to you to check out the episode but it's phenomenal it's phenomenal thought-provoking and phenomenal and excited me much as the outer limits and star trek the next generation and twilight zone all that kind of stuff did when i was younger just brilliant <laughs> you know and it really makes me want to check out the rest of black mirror at some point um i could not more highly issue superlatives and applause for this episode it subverted expectations it, it did this really it, it played out and doled out this story in a really twisted creative way and the fact that it was sort of paying homage in its backdrop to Star Trek, you know, again, it's not satirizing, it's not spoofing, uh, it's not a commentary on, it's just the backdrop. But it's a very stylistic backdrop, and it's a really creative backdrop, and it's one that they utilize all the components of to the fullest to really immerse you into the mentality of all of the surrounding characters, especially the, the, the sort of villain, the baddie, that is the character of Robert Daly, who created this environment. And uh, the jeopardy it puts the digital doppelganger, you know, sentient creations in, and, and, you know, they are all suffering, and they will be forever suffering if they if they cannot find a way to, to quell his, his sick, sadistic ways and everything like that. It completely flips everything on its ear where at first you're warmed to him and you feel sympathetic, sympathetic toward him, empathetic toward him, but then you realize how much of a sick, twisted bastard he really is and you completely flip and, and sympathize and empathize much more with all of the surrounding characters that you didn't really know much about. And the way the story is doled out, you get to know them so much more. You get to, again, you know, you grow rapport with them. And you just want to see them somehow stop him. And they do manage to, to, to bring about a twist that not only plays into whether or not they are capable of freeing themselves, but also that might or might not have ramifications on the Robert Daly character in the real world as well. Which I did think was a little bit questionable like as sick and, and sadistic and twisted as the character was and proved to be was he necessarily deserving of of what his eventual fate would be by the end or at least what it's implied his fate will be by the end again i leave that to you guys you can you know engage me uh, in the comments below 
talking about the episode if you've already seen it. If you were as impressed with it as I was, let me know that below. Uh, if for some reason you didn't like it, you know, if not, why not? Let me know that as well. It's all about the topic of talk, talking about great, creative, fantastic series and, and episodes and movies like this this particular episode turned out to be of Black Mirror again, season four episode, USS Callister. Uh, I was just thoroughly rocked by it and entertained by it, and I loved all the twists and turns and uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enamored with Kristen Milioti, as I say, <laughs> you know, once again. And uh, so, yeah, I'd love to hear from you what you thought of this episode. If you've seen it, if you haven't already, and you're still watching this video, what's wrong with you? You, you should have, you know, gone and watched it first. Um, but, you know, hopefully this will give you uh, uh, some extra, you know, Things to think about it, things to consider about it, and, and maybe things that you didn't necessarily think about of your own accord, or maybe you did. And let's have a discussion about that in the comments below. So yeah, <laughs> otherwise that'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. Live long and prosper. Peace. All of that good stuff. And I'll catch you later. Peace. <laughs>